future and the future generation. We come together today for the future of our children. Our young people have a voice, they are the next leaders. We have, we survived, 
We are the resilient people of Canada. for you. 
That's our healing room. Thank you.
I always, uh, I teach a whole bunch of my grandkids, my kids, because they're our future. I teach them how to sing. I may be a woman, but I was grown up by a bunch of grandfathers, grandmothers. I don't think, I think women and men should be equal in every division. We should never discriminate a woman because I think women are priceless. And so, you are doing a good thing today because Mother Earth needs it. We, she needs the help of her people. And we can't do it alone. And our kids have taught us that lesson because they are our future. They're the ones that are going to live here in the future. So, us ladies are going to do a strong woman song. Uh, it's going to be led by Nadia. One star. We'll do four starts. No. Next, we would like to invite 
Luke Nelson from Edmonton Youth for Climate up to do a land acknowledgement. Hello everyone and welcome. My name, as you just heard, is Luke Nelson and I am a climate organizer with Edmonton Youth for Climate. And I am also a settler. As a settler that has lived in Edmonton my entire life, it can be hard to fully understand that I'm currently living, working, and going to school on stolen land. It's grasping the realities of colonialism and the lasting impact that it has on all of Canada is a difficult and often uncomfortable process to undertake, but it is also crucial. I have been involved in organizing the strikes in Edmonton since the first one in March. When I first started to participate, yeah, When I first started to participate in climate organizing, I had an abstract understanding of colonialism, one that could be gained from books. But I hadn't begun to start questioning how my privilege affected me and those around me. As a white, cisgender, heterosexual male, I have a lot of privilege in our society. And maybe many people living within the borders of Canada don't have the same experience as I do when living in our society. Accepting the realities and underlying systematic racism in Canada is not a simple process, and I am certainly not finished understanding it. But as someone who has directly benefited from colonial violence, I now know that it is important to start questioning why Canadian society is the way that it is. And thus, before we begin the rest of today's proceedings, it is vital to give a land acknowledgement. This type of acknowledgement is certainly not in any way an ultimate solution to the problems created by colonialism, but it is also an important step to help grasp that as a settler, I am living on land that has never rightfully been mine. We acknowledge that the land... We acknowledge that the land we are standing on is Treaty 6 territory. Treaty... Treaty 6 is the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. In particular, the area now known as Edmonton is in the ancestral home of the Papas Chase Cree. Some people may be surprised to hear what a strong emphasis we give to Indigenous rights at a climate protest. However, colonialism is fundamentally connected to the climate crisis. It is vital that the Indigenous peoples who have protected their land for centuries have their voices heard. The genocide of indigenous peoples in Canada may seem like ancient history, but the continued oppression and their struggle against oppression are very much ongoing. When we strive for a solution to the climate crisis in Canada, we must also simultaneously address the need for decolonization and repatriation. Thank you. sharing a quote from a fellow indigenous and defender from Coast Salish territory, Takaya Blaney. Quote, Montreal climate strike was one of the most racist protests I've ever been in. Was intentionally pushed, received non-stop racial remarks like it's not just your land, and had to fight for space the entire time. This is what happens when you whitewash climate change, unquote. We want to thank Greta for standing with us in solidarity and lifting up Indigenous voices of this territory. This is our land. For those who believe it's not just Indigenous people's land, I'd like for you guys, for you guys to keep in mind that Indigenous peoples have been here on Turtle Island for time immemorial and our knowledge has come from teachings that my elders have passed down. So I ask you to please respect and honor that. We share this land, but that's because Indigenous 
indigenous peoples were kind enough to let Europeans settle here. Our ancestors didn't make agreements so that we would be pushed to the side or have to fight for a chance to speak.
our sacred medicines that we once were able to pick for our ceremony and prayer are now slowly disappearing. I was reading an article where it said that Inuit have been bringing warnings about global warming to the international community as far back as the first Earth Summit in 1992. That proves that indigenous people have been talking about this issue, but we are continuously ignored. As indigenous people, we know firsthand that our people have been impacted for many years by climate change. Indigenous people need to be more a part of these things that are said about climate change. We need to be able to sit at the table and help our world leaders to be better as they need us.
indigenous. She is a settler of color. She is an organizer with Climate Justice Edmonton and fundamentally believes that climate justice must prioritize BIPOC, disabled and frontline communities. I want to make it extra clear I'm not indigenous. <laughs> so, a couple of days ago, one of my best buds, Bronwyn Tucker, wrote a thread on Twitter. She talked about how excited we were that Greta was joining us here today, but how there have been so many other organizers here that have been fighting for climate justice here in Alberta and leading the way for so long. Executive Director of Indigenous Climate Action. <laughs> Folks like Veronica Fuentes, which is a young, a young organizer with the Beaver Hills Warriors, and Emma Jackson, and Stephen Bueller, and Gabrielle Gelderman, and Marco Luciano, who fights for migrant justice every single day, and Crystal Lehman, who has looked industry in the eye and said no. Folks like Molly Swain and, Chris, and Chelsea Bowell who are actively working to make sure that Indigenous people get their land back. <laughs> looking at this incredible list of people and looking at all of you today, I know that we can win. I know that we can win because I refuse to believe that my generation will go down in the world as it is. We know that our house is on fire. And while we have a government that continues to deny that the climate crisis is in fact a crisis, communities are already seeing the devastating impacts of rising sea levels, of a wildfire season in the west and a flood season in the east, the erosion of traditional territories and the destruction of islands like the one that my mother grew up on. My mom grew up on an island called Pemba in eastern Africa. As a result of rising sea levels, that island will be underwater. Generations of my family's history will be erased. I will never be able to return home to the lands that my family comes from. This is what the climate crisis is stealing from us. our ability to return to our homelands and destroy the places that we come from. That is cool. <laughs> I grew up here at the mouth of the Alberta tar sands, being spoon fed a myth that when there is a boom in Alberta oil and gas industry, everyone does well and the future. Looking back, I know that that's a lie. while destroying the communities that they come from. But the industry can feel inescapable and omnipresent here in Alberta. Going to school here, we're indoctrinated with the benefits of the oil and gas industry while they continue to contaminate water and land in northern indigenous communities. And living here can feel incredibly hostile on the best of days for climate organizers. Particularly when we have a government that is in the pocket of big oil, a government that continues to prioritize the needs of industry over the needs of workers. Over the rights of indigenous peoples. 
But addressing the climate crisis fundamentally means breaking down the foundations of what created it in the first place. It means that we are not accepting band-aid solutions to systemic problems. It means that we are going to address white supremacy and extractive capitalism in our fight to address the climate crisis. first climate strike and we had maybe a couple hundred people and just last month on the 27th we had thousands and today we have even more so thank you so much for coming this movement is only going to continue to grow all of us are here proving that climate change is the defining issue of our generation but the problem is that some people don't see it that way Alberta is a province defined by its dependence on oil and gas, which makes all of us responsible for the warming of our planet. This also gives us all, it gives all of us the greater responsibility to fix this problem and push for a just transition to renewable energy. We know that the world's future is up in the air and that it is not something that we can just sit by and idly watch. It is clear to see that there is a green wave among the youth, but we cannot fight this fight alone. The climate crisis affects us all, regardless of our age, political affiliation, race, gender, or sexual orientation. It affects workers in the oil and gas industry as well, who often feel we are trying to take away their jobs, but this is not the case. We do not hate oil workers. We understand that the oil and gas sector are a big part of people's livelihoods. But we need to start working now. But we need to start working now while we have time in order to have a just transition for all. It is crucial we work toward... <laughs> We work 
toward diversifying the economy because no matter what, the carbon emissions from oil production are detrimental to our environment. Canada is one of the worst per capita emitters of greenhouse gas in the world, and yet we claim to be a green country. As the worst per capita emitter out of the G20 countries, Canada is three times worse than the average, average emission rate, and Alberta is eight times worse than the average. The effects... <laughs> the effects of climate change, wildfires, extreme weather events, and so on, are visible in Alberta even today, and they are only going to get worse. Real science tells us that the wildfires we're seeing now, such as the one that ransacked Fort Mac, are going to increase in number and severity as droughts get worse, high winds increase, and lightning strikes become more common. The climate crisis is undeniably real. The science speaks for itself, and we need to start acting on it. Youth voices are growing in Alberta, and they're only going to continue to get louder. rights and sovereignty, creates millions of good new jobs through green energy, and enshrines dignity and justice for all. Indigenous peoples have been leading this movement for far longer than any of the settlers on this land. We have an opportunity to follow their example, and we should gladly take it. If we are to expect other countries to care about this crisis, people in privileged positions as us need to take drastic action now because we have the resources and ability to do so. Instead, our government is building pipelines, which only deepens our oil dependency. <laughs> Jason Nixon said, we have the most environmentally friendly place in the world to produce oil and gas products. This is simply untrue. Oil sands oil is not clean whatsoever. And it is not even about how clean the oil is. Narratives like this deviate from the core problem and ignore the science. The science is the unifying aspect of this movement, and we will keep striking until it is recognized. Once again, we would like to thank everybody for their continual and ongoing support. We hope to see you at our many future events, and be sure to follow us on Instagram, student.strike.yay, um, to keep up with our organizing and everything that we're gonna be doing in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Madison and Claire. We've had governments protect industries at the expense of the rest of us. This isn't about Greta. Young, young people in indigenous communities have been fighting for a way of life we all deserve. We must work towards a transition way away. We must work towards a transition away from oil and gas that is just and fair to all impact communities. And ensures dignity and livelihood of workers across industries and across regions. Now we would like to welcome Swedish teenage climate activist Thank you so much, everyone who's here. It's 
I don't know how many we haven't received any numbers yet, but it looks like thousands upon thousands. So thank you so much. It's incredible to see so many young people and indigenous leaders gathered here today. And uh, you are the hope. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> I want to respectfully acknowledge that we are gathered today on Treaty 6 territory. gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples including the Cree, Blackfoot, Metis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Inuit and many others whose histories, languages and cultures and peoples continue all around us. And reception I received here in Alberta. People are so nice and and I'm very proud to be with you here today in Edmonton. We love you! We love you, Greta! So today is Friday. And as always, we are on climate strike. Young people all around the globe are today sacrificing their education to bring attention to the climate and ecological emergency. And we are not doing this because we want to. We aren't doing it because it's fun. We aren't doing it because we have a special interest in the climate or because we want to become politicians when we grow up. We are doing this because our future is at stake. We are doing this because in this crisis, we will not be bystanders. And, and, and we are doing it because we want the people in power to unite behind the science. In the IPCC SR 1.5 report that was released last year, it says that if we are to have a 67% chance of limiting the global temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees, we had on January 1st, 2018, 420 gigatons of carbon dioxide left in our CO2 budget. And now that number is down to less than 360 gigatons as we emit 42 gigatons of CO2 every year if you include land use. At current emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget is gone within less than eight and a half years. Again, that budget is for a 67% chance of staying below a 1.5 degrees of global temperature rise and avoiding the risk of setting off several irreversible chain reactions beyond human control that would lead to enormous sufferings for countless of people, especially among indigenous communities and people in the global south. Sixty-seven percent chance and that is the best odds the IPCC has given us. And please note that these figures are global and do therefore not mention the aspect of equity. 
clearly stated throughout the Paris Agreement, which is essential to make it work on a global scale. That means that richer countries such as Sweden or Canada need to get down to zero emissions much faster so that, so that people in poorer parts of the world so that people in poorer parts of the world can heighten their standard of living by building some of the infrastructure that we have already built such as roads, hospitals, electricity, schools and providing clean drinking water. These numbers also don't include tipping points, most feedback loops, nor additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution. And they also rely on our generation removing astronomical amounts of CO2, previous generations CO2, out of the atmosphere with technologies that haven't yet been invented at scale and maybe never will. And this is what it's all about. This is what we are saying. This is not opinions or political views. This is the current best available science. And the politics that even recognize this are still nowhere in sight. Yeah. We teenagers are not scientists, nor are we politicians. But it seems many of us, apart from most others, understand the science because we have done our homework. <laughs> if people really knew about these things, they wouldn't need to ask me why I'm so passionate about climate change. <laughs> if people really were aware of this, they wouldn't need to ask us why we are school striking for the climate and taking it to the streets. If people really knew about the full consequences of the climate and ecological emergency, then they would join us in the streets. And moving on from words to action. To, to solve this, we need to start treating this crisis as a crisis because you cannot solve an emergency without treating it as one. And without seeing the full picture. You cannot leave the responsibility to individuals, politicians, the market, or other parts of the world to take because this has to include everything and everyone and no one must be left behind we cannot allow this crisis to continue to be a partisan political question the climate and ecological crisis is far beyond party politics and the main enemy right now should not be any political opponents because our en main enemy right now is physics. Some people say that we are fighting for our future, but that is not true. We are not fighting for our future. We are fighting for everyone's future. And if you think we should be in school instead, then we suggest you take our place in the streets. Or better yet, or better yet, join us so we can speed up the process. One year ago, 
we were just a handful of school children. And today, we are over 7.5 million people across the world that make up this movement. If that is possible, then just imagine what we could do together if we really wanted to. Nothing is impossible if enough people stand united. So thank you and continue, never give up. We stand together. But here we go.